Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from the videos posted on YouTube and on Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments come through social media sites like Reddit, Mastodon, sometimes through email. And the very first question I want to address is, Hey DT, will you actually try out Windows 11? And I'm really conflicted about this because those of you that have been following my channel for a while know I only use free and open source software and I never cover proprietary software on this channel, right? In life, I try to strictly use free and open source software. The only time I use proprietary software is when I'm forced to because there's no free alternatives to a particular piece of software. For example, device drivers, you know, video drivers, Wi-Fi drivers. Some of those are proprietary only. There's no free drivers for some pieces of hardware. So sometimes you're forced to use proprietary software, but for the most part, that's rare these days. Like 99.9% .9 of, the, of the software running on my machines is free and open source software. And, and I don't like giving proprietary software any kind of coverage. You know, I, I never give it any kind of love on video. You guys know I don't like proprietary software. I try to spread the message of free and open source software. But will I try out Windows 11? You know, this has got me thinking a little differently because Windows 11 is a unique situation because I really think this is an important moment in history where I think Windows 11 could actually help drive adoption to Linux. And I think highlighting the differences between Windows and Linux could be a good thing because when people see how much better Linux is compared to Windows, all the things that Linux does so much better than Windows, you know, in a side by side comparison, that could be a great thing to help drive people to Linux, because I know many of you guys are probably Windows users and you're interested in Linux. Maybe you're interested in eventually switching to Linux. So, you know, demonstrating some of the differences on camera, I think, would be beneficial. Now, I'm not ever going to install Windows on any of my personal machines, my physical machines, because I have too much respect for these machines and for myself personally to put a freedom restricting privacy invasive operating system on any of my machines. I'm never going to do that. But what I might do is I may spin up some virtual machines of Windows 11 and keep those around just again to highlight the differences of Windows and Linux and hopefully to help you guys that are making that transition, you know, help you guys make some informed decisions. And the next question is, hey DT, I really like how deep in desktop looks, but how secure is it? So I made a video the other day where I compared Windows 11 and Deepin. And this guy, I guess he runs Windows and he's thinking about, hey, I really like you know the Deepin Linux distribution. It looks really pretty, but how secure is it? Well, the great thing about Linux in general, <laughs> and this is all Linux distributions because they're all licensed under a free and open source license. The Linux kernel itself is licensed under the GPL, which is the GNU General Public License, meaning it's all open source. Anybody can look at the code, anybody can modify it, anybody can redistribute it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Linux kernel has thousands of people that regularly contribute to the kernel and thousands of people constantly looking at code in the kernel. And the Linux kernel is actually what is under the hood of not just the Deepin Linux distribution, but all GNU slash Linux distributions. Because I've had the same question from people considering Linux Mint, Ubuntu, you guys, you know, you're switching from Windows and you found a Linux distribution that appeals to you in some way, but hey, how secure is it? It's a thousand times more secure than Microsoft Windows. The fact that it's free and open source software makes it inherently more secure than proprietary operating systems like Windows and Mac ever can be because they're closed source. Nobody gets to look at the code. You don't know what Microsoft and Apple are actually doing to you in that code. And that's the reason it's closed source is it's not because they're afraid people are going to find vulnerabilities in their code is because they know there are vulnerabilities in that code because sometimes Microsoft and Apple put those things in the code to spy on you themselves. And, you know, you don't have to worry about that with free and open source software. So if you're concerned about security at all, you know, if you're a new to Linux user, you're thinking of making the switch from Windows or Mac to Linux and security is one of your concerns, put those concerns to the side. They're, they're not really an issue at all. And moving on to the next question, this one is rather cute. Hey DT, would you mind not censoring me? So I get this kind of question all the time. <laughs> People will post in the comments, hey, why'd you delete my post? Or why are you censoring me? Or, you know, what happened to my message, etc., etc. Uh, that's not me. I have no control over YouTube 
auto-deleting comments. The YouTube algorithm goes out of its way to find comments and delete them, even my own comments. Sometimes my own comments get deleted <laughs> from YouTube, right? And I have, you know, 120,000 subscribers. I'm a verified content creator. I'm obviously not a bot. I'm obviously not a spammer. They auto-delete some of my messages sometimes. You know, really easy messages that are not controversial in any way. Like I'm telling another content creator, hey, great job on this video or nice video or things like that. And they just delete my message. I have no control over that, right? So uh, you guys have to understand that I'm not sitting around moderating my comment section. I don't have time for that. I get way too many comments on my videos to read every comment and moderate the comments at all. So unless I spot something that's way out of bounds, and usually I don't even have to do that because, you know, if somebody's making threats of violence and things like that towards somebody else, typically other people are going to report your comment. You know, I don't have to go out of my way to search for these things. YouTube is pretty good of, of taking care of that stuff. But the problem is their algorithms are very aggressive and they have to be aggressive because honestly, right now, the YouTube platform is overrun by spam bots. I mean, it's, it's almost like it's been taken over by these spam bots, but because of their fight against the spammers, sometimes innocent comments get tripped up in the algorithms and the filters. And, and there's just no, there, there's nothing anybody can do about that. I'm not censoring you. I don't even know who you are, or what your post was. I never read your post. Moving on to the next comment. Hey DT, I think you should never show the terminal to a normal person who doesn't have a technical background. I 100% completely disagree with that statement. I think we should show the terminal. I think we should expose people to the command line, the bash shell, and all the cool shell utilities. It's you know, People fear the terminal and fear the command line and fear all of this technical stuff. It's because they don't know it. It's they, they've never been exposed to it. They don't understand it. That's the only thing they fear. They fear what they don't know. Everybody, that's all aspects of life. People fear the unknown. When you're walking along the city streets, right? If you're Walking down a very dark, not well lit alley, you can't really see where you're going or what's down that alley. Would you be afraid? Hell yeah, you'd be afraid, right? But if it's brightly lit, you know, it looks like there's a spotlight on that thing, you're fine, right? Because you can see that there's nothing scary in that alley. It's the same thing with Linux and the terminal. You know, when I do all of this stuff in the terminal, all I'm doing is shining a light on the terminal. And when I shine that light on it, People no longer fear it. The next question. Hey, DT, would you ever use Gentoo as your main operating system? Uh, I could, but would I? Probably not, because I don't like source-based distributions on my main production machine. And I'm assuming that's what they're talking about. They're talking about, would I ever use Gentoo to do this kind of work, this video content creation kind of work? And because of the stuff I do on my particular channel, this will be different for other people. But for me, I do a lot with a lot of different pieces of software. I'm installing software all the time, right? I'm trying out new pieces of software all the time. And I, my system is quite heavily bloated. I have more than 2,000 packages installed right now on Arch Linux, right? Imagine if instead of being a binary distribution like Arch, I was running a source-based distribution like Gentoo or Nix or Geeks or Slackware. So, you know, something where, you know, much of the... the the programs that you're installing have to compile. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of time just sitting there waiting for stuff to compile. And that's wasted time, right? That's not benefiting me in any way. That's all it's doing is that's downtime that I can't be using my computer while it's doing that, while it's spending two hours to, to compile software, you know, for a big update or whatever. You know, I can't use my CPU to be doing things like rendering video or recording video or streaming video or whatever it is I want to do for all of this. So no, Gentoo wouldn't make sense for me to run on my main production machine. Now, you know, eventually I'm going to have a computer at home right now. I don't have a home computer, but I'm planning on buying one eventually. And because I won't be doing this kind of work on the home computer, it'll just be for fun, for play. Then I might actually do some hopping on that computer. I, I wouldn't mind living in Gen 2 on that machine or, or Nix or Geeks or some, you know, some of those source based distributions. But for this kind of work, um, I have to run a binary distribution. It just doesn't make any sense for me not to do that. 
Moving on to the next comment. Watch out, DT. Audacity is listed in your open software I use list in the description of the video. And he's right. In the bottom of the description of every video, I list a bunch of free and open source software that I use and I promote to you guys just you know to answer some questions like, hey, what's some of the software you use? Because that's one of the most common questions I get. Hey, what browser you use? What do you use for your virtual machines, et cetera, et cetera. So I link to a whole bunch of software that I like and I want you guys to try out and Audacity is currently listed there and it's staying there for now it's just because until there is a real fork that I want to promote uh, Audacity is fine and, and the people that are installing Audacity especially you guys on Linux you're not installing the new Audacity anyway all the Linux distributions right now are holding back to the previous versions of Audacity before they added the telemetry and, and the weird privacy policy and all that. So you're still getting the free and open source Audacity, but eventually, yes, I, I need to remove that and replace it with something else. I'm just waiting to see where all the contributors move to because eventually they'll all back one of these forks. Right now, it, it's just kind of a mess because there's like a dozen of these forks and nobody's really kind of adopted one yet. And I think part of the problem is all of these audacity forks are kind of immature <laughs> and just have horrible branding too. None of them have a name that makes any sense. I, 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 I the sneedacity one doesn't make any sense. Audio city sounds like circuit city. It sounds like, a, you know, like Best Buy, like I, I, audio city is the place you go to buy speakers. Right? It's a horrible name for a digital audio workstation. And, and all of them, there's so many of them that, the, nobody spent more than like 30 seconds thinking of branding. And I think if one of these forks actually branded themselves properly and looked like it was going to be a professional product, everybody would jump behind it. And so would I. Moving on to the next comment is, Hey DT, I was a Unix system admin for 34 years. I knew most of this, but you still managed to teach me a few new tricks. You missed your calling. I know you like retail a lot, but you're also an awesome teacher and trainer. That is a rare skill. Kudos. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for the kind words there. And you're right as far as me being a good teacher, a good trainer. That's one of my strengths. It's always been a strength of mine in all of my professions, any job I ever had. I was always the guy that, that taught other people, trained other people, whatever skill it was that needed to be taught. Because I have this way where I can... I can connect to people, I can talk to people, I can talk people through something slowly, methodically, and get them from point A to point B, where some people are horrible teachers, right? They talk fast or or they try to they try to rush people, right? And, and I'm not one of those kinds of people. And as far as missing my calling in life, I should have went into system administration instead of retail. I actually no longer work in retail. If you haven't been following the channel for a while, I actually quit working in retail about a year and a half ago because of the pandemic. Where I was working at, I was a supervisor at a large retailer. And then the, the shutdown happened. They were closed for two months during the shutdown. I actually quit at the beginning of the shutdown because they were already struggling. Retail in general were struggling. I knew the pandemic was going to cause several of the big retailers to go bankrupt, including the one I was working at. They went bankrupt and they cut all the position, a lot of the supervisory positions, including the position I held. So I, I wouldn't have been around even if I'd have stuck around. So I got out because I already had this side gig lined up, right? I had a second job, this, you know, making video content. And this just transitioned into my primary job. And, and that's all I've done for the last year and a half. Now that the world is kind of getting back to normal, I have considered maybe getting back into retail a little bit, maybe working again, you know, just to, just to get back, you know, a real job, if you will. Although I, I will say that this keeps me occupied enough I, I don't know if I really have enough time to do this the way I've been doing it and also have a full-time job, but I may uh, go back and do some part-time work or something. Uh, system administration, though, I don't think I missed anything by not getting into that because it's not that you know I should have been a system admin. I should have been a teacher, and that's what this is. This is why this is such an easy thing for me to do as far as video content creation because I was always a good teacher in real life, and this just is an extension of that. And the next comment, hey DT, you need to put a disclaimer or warning in your videos. Customization is addictive. From your videos, I've fallen in love with Awesome Window Manager, Xmonad, and OpenBox. You're absolutely right. Customization, because of all the customization options available on Linux, right? It's ultimate customization, right? It's just anything you can imagine you can do on Linux. 
and it's extremely addictive, especially once you start swapping out desktop environments, window managers, and terminal emulators, you know, start plugging and playing, right? You, you get rid of this program, add in this program, and it's never ending, right? You're constantly, you're not just distro hopping because uh, that's addictive too. A lot of people like trying out new Linux distributions, but after a while, you realize it's not just the distribution you want to change. You want to change out everything about your operating system. And it's extremely addictive, but it's also rewarding because you learn a lot along the journey. And the final question on this edition of Hey DT is, Hey DT, how can I learn Emacs Lisp? E Lisp. Well, let me let me go ahead and tell you that there are a couple of books out there. That I think they're freely available. I know there's one that the GNU guys recommend on the GNU site is Mastering Emacs, I believe is the name of the book. I could be wrong about that, but I believe if you just want like a PDF version of it, I, I, it's freely available. If you wanted a hardback, you could buy a hardback, uh, you know, actual book if you prefer a, a physical book. Uh, another one that I used in the past because I had it on a Kindle. Again, I don't know the exact name, but I want to say it's Learn to Program in Emacs Lisp. I want to say that's the title. I could be wrong about that, but there's books out there about Emacs Lisp. Well, a lot of them, actually. Some of them freely available if you just want a, a digital download. Now, when he asks, how can I learn eLisp? I get questions all the time. How can I learn insert name a program, insert name of programming language, how can I learn something? And this is one of the most common types of questions I get that I really want to spend some time addressing this, is you guys, if you're trying to learn something, what you need to figure out is what kind of learner are you? Are you somebody that needs to read something, technical documentation, a wiki, you know, a white paper? I'm kind of that person because I'm you know, in, in my mid 40s, I grew up really before the Internet was a thing where, you know, I went to libraries, checked out books to actually learn something to read. If I wanted to learn something, I went and got a book from the library about it. You know, once the Internet came around, you know, I was already late teens, early 20s when the Internet started. But the early days of the Internet, you didn't have video content because Internet speeds were so slow. What you did was you read articles, wiki articles. And, and that's kind of what I've stuck to all these years is I'm a reader. You know, I'll go pull up the Arch Wiki to learn anything about Linux, for example. Some people are not that way, though. Some people are visual learners. They learn by watching somebody else do the tasks that they're trying to learn. If you're one of those type of people, I promise you there's a million videos on uh, programming in Emacs Lisp on YouTube or probably a million videos on YouTube about whatever it is that you want to learn. So just do a search on YouTube, find that video content if you're a visual learner. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. I'm talking about Absy, Gabe, James, Mitchell, Paul, Wes, Akami, Alan, Chuck, Kirk, David, Dylan, Gregory, Haiku, Erjan, Alexander, Peace, Arch, and Fedor, Polytech, Raver, Scott, Stephen, and Willie. They're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon without these guys. This episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. I also need to thank each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen as well. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because the DistroTube channel... I don't have any corporate sponsors. It's just me and you guys, the community. If you like my work and want to support me, please look for DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace.